Let us pray. Ever living God, we thank you for the life you have given us as one body in Christ in the Diocese of Vermont. We thank you also for the ministry to which you have called us, even in the extraordinary time of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the power of your spirit, you have taught us to see things cast down being raised up, things grown old being made new, and things brought to their perfection by the one through whom all things were made. Be among us tonight as we continue to seek just and responsible ways to gather your people and minister in Christ's name. Give us the heart and mind to keep care for the most vulnerable foremost in what we do. We are grateful that you have kept this diocese both safe and created these many months. As we look to a new day in the life of your church, inspire us, make us redeeming and reconciling people and keep us moving. This we ask through our savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Bishop Shannon. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. And as we begin our time this evening, I offer thanks for and recognition of the Abeniki people on whose unceded land we live, work, and serve from and from where I greet you. Thankful that we are in these places and remembering the people who came before us. On March 15th of 2020, none of us knew how long we would be living in a pandemic. On that evening, on March 15th, people across our diocesan household gathered for the first of many services where scripture and a screen became a staple for feeding our daily hungry hunger to be in community. From the beginning, our restart team has prayerfully worked. They've worked hard uh, to research and stay informed on how science and public health practices and responsibilities intersect with our baptismal vow to love our neighbor and to respect the dignity of every human being. From the beginning, our goal has been to help our congregations offer hospitality to as many people as possible, as safely as possible. Clergy and lay people have worked hard to include people who are not always able to be present at worship. You've planned carefully, thoughtfully, and creatively. You've collaborated and supported each other. You have responded to our call to strive for justice and peace by carrying on the work of racial reconciliation through learning and actions. You have continued to care for people in need as the need for food assistance rose when people lost jobs and worked with community organizations to attend to the needs of people experiencing homelessness. We have been an example in our communities of what it looks like to care for and include the most vulnerable in our midst. We did not create situations where the virus could spread. And whew, regathering is such a joy. Ooh, we need to party for you know at least a couple of years after what we've lived through. But anyway, regathering is such a joy and all the more so because we saved lives. In the spirit of celebration, inclusion, and care, we will continue to answer the call to love one another as we regather means doing our very best to provide safe meeting spaces. We will take steps to safely include our children, friends, and neighbors in our communities who are not vaccinated or who are immunocompromised. This meeting tonight is meant to help us do just that to share information, resources, and ideas, to ask questions and stay connected as we move forward. In all of this, may we never forget that we continue to be the church, the beloved body of Christ. And none of this has been easy for anyone, but you put others first. We have so much to celebrate as we open up our buildings and have more ways to be together. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your hard work. And I'm looking forward to continuing to see the fruits of the seeds of collaboration that we've sown. 
through Coronatide, we've learned so much, we've prayed so much, and through our sacrifice, we've loved others so much. And you know, we are, uh, we're, we continue to be the church, the beloved body of Christ, even and especially as we have lived through this time together. So I would like to hand over the screen to Anne Gio, who will share some medical and scientific information with some visuals, and they're quite fascinating. Thank you, Shannon. Um, uh, I'm a pediatrician. I'm not an infectious disease specialist nor an epidemiologist, but in the course of being on this committee, I have been listening and really pestering my colleagues in those fields a lot for a year, um, as well as reading a lot of data. And um, we've shared a lot in this committee um, of the science of what's going on, which has been fascinating. Um, and uh, we're doing that in the pursuit of caring for all of us, as Bishop Shannon says, of all ages as we restart and reopen safely. So to review a little bit of public health right now, um, we've been very careful in Vermont with our mitigation strategies as a whole state, um, as you know. We have the highest vaccination rate in the country and we have the lowest case numbers in the country. Um, and given all that, all those steps we've taken, uh, unfortunately, we've still lost 255 Vermonters to COVID, but we've probably saved another 250 or more lives by our mitigation strategies through the state. And in addition to that, there was nearly no influenza this year in our state. And that always takes the lives of adults and children and babies every year, not this year. So even more lives saved. And particularly of importance to those of us who care for children and love children, which is a lot of us, no babies died of respiratory viruses this year in our state, which is unheard of. So we have a lot to celebrate, a lot. Um, but we're all eager to get back to being together. We're we're all, all of us. Um, and so as you know, if you've been listening to the news at all, and I know if you're here, you probably have. Uh, right now, we have 78.4% of eligible Vermonters who have had one dose of vaccine. Now, anybody that's under age 12 isn't eligible, so they're not counted in that 78%. Um, and, um, and that's really just the percentage who've had one dose, the first dose. Um, and in the younger eligible category, the 12 to 29 year olds, just about 50% of eligible Vermonters have had that first dose. So that's great, um, but that's a lot of people who are not fully vaccinated and are still at risk, who are on their way to being vaccinated. There's great news about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that we have data about, which is that they really confer excellent protection against not only the original variant that started in this country, but all of the other variants that are, are now all of the cases basically in the US. Um, and um, those vaccines, we have good data confer great um, immunity, but only after the second dose plus two weeks, only then. If you've only had one dose against those variants, it's just about 25 to 35% um, effective. So you need both doses plus two weeks or the Johnson and Johnson plus two weeks. And Francis Collins who heads the NIH has said publicly that um, he thinks the data are coming to show that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be e equally efficacious, but we don't have those data yet. And my colleagues in ID and epidemiology haven't seen those data yet, but I don't think Francis Collins would say that if, it, if he hadn't seen some emerging data coming. So I think that's really great, but it requires both doses or the J&J &J plus two weeks. So, um, 
in addition to that, in spite of that time of indecision a year ago that is now coming out in the news that um, when they released Anthony Fauci's early emails and everybody was kind of dithering about whether masks really work. Well, we know that masks really work now. We know that wearing a multi-layer, well-fitted cloth mask does protect others and it also protects the wearer. So given all of that information about how many of us, even in Vermont, are not fully protected, um, the CDC, Mark Levine, Governor Scott, all the infectious disease and epidemiology experts I've spoken with, everybody says that anyone who's not fully vaccinated, anyone who's immune suppressed, all of those people should be masked indoors all the time. The data about outdoor transmission um, is encouraging. When people are separated by several feet, there's probably very little risk to the unvaccinated people. There's extremely low risk to that fully vaccinated people outdoors, but the, for the unvaccinated immune suppressed babies, whoever outdoors, there's probably very little risk if you're several feet apart. But if you're together, closer together, you're sitting around a table having dinner um, or you're you know, leaning on a bar stool outside or um, you're on a jungle gym or in a bouncy house and in the case of little kids, there's risk and those people should be masked. So um, um, in, in the recognition that there is still transmission going on in this country um, and uh, cited in a recent, very recent article in the Washington Post, um, you can find and probably Fred will put the reference in the chat uh, in a few minutes, but um, among people who are not vaccinated, the degree of transmission is the same still across the country as it was several months ago for the unvaccinated. So those people can't stand down right yet. So um, as we go about our business, we are making recommendations to take steps to open our churches while maintaining care and radical welcome for all, for our children, for our members who are immune suppressed, for our members who are not yet fully vaccinated. Um, and as this is a virus that is transmitted by aerosol, um, we're gonna show you a quick visual just to demonstrate some very basic approaches uh, to decreasing risk. This is an article from the New York Times from, a few, from uh, February. Um, which just shows you some graphics. This is a New York City classroom with people sitting at desks. They've already decreased the density. This is a typical classroom where people were too crowded. So, so whenever they went to um, full-time school, they decreased the density, put the desks six feet apart, um, put the kids in masks. And then this is showing where the airflow goes. You can see the little blue aerosol kind of rising and swimming around the room um, between these children. And then there's one infected student here in the front row, uh, kind of looking at the teacher. And um, they're showing here in red what happens with the aerosol from that particular student and how it spreads all around the room, um, high, low, in the room, and everywhere. Um, Keep going on down. So they, they, they suggest opening a window. There's a window that's open now. And you can see as um, we scroll down, the infected students still sitting there, but the density of that redness, the, the aerosol from that student is a lot less getting to the other people in the room just by having one window open. And that's it, just one window. Um, then they put a fan directed in to the room um, to try to move air more quickly. And um, it does move air around more quickly. But unfortunately, what it does is it blows that aerosol from the infected student right at one or two other people. And you'll see that in a few minutes as we scroll downward that the teacher lands, the teacher's in an unfortunate spot here and lands in a very 
red area um, where he or she is exposed to, um, uh, to some infected aerosol uh, pretty badly. So with the window closed, you see there's a lot of dark red infected aerosol here. Um, and you can see it goes all the way down. It's right where people are breathing. Um, as they open the window, I just like keep going down, Kathleen. Um, uh, you'll see in a minute that they're gonna open the window and the infected student's still there. Um, and um, there's a lot less aerosol um, infecting or affecting the other people in the room, except for the teacher with the fan uh, blowing at the teacher. So um, our subsequent speakers um, and committee members are gonna talk about mitigation strategies, but I will start by saying, turn the fan around, aim it out of the room, make it an exhaust fan. You'll see they've parked an air cleaner in the middle of this room. And, um, and that's gonna be the basis of the simple mitigation strategies that um, Bob is now going to discuss a little bit in more specific detail. And Kathleen has just put the reference for that New York Times article in the chat. So, right. So, Bob, take it away here. Myself. Okay. So, pretty simple thing. Um, Anna has talked about this kind of layered approach to being indoors, wearing masks, maintaining, continuing to maintain good social distance, especially to unvaccinated and highly vulnerable individuals continue to talk about washed hands. And those are pretty simple things that we all know how to do. And actually clean air is probably pretty simple too, but it sometimes seems to be a little bit uh, daunting to figure it out because uh, there's some complicated portions to it. Next slide. And one of the things that about air circulation that we have uh, not been able to find is a, a clear definition of how often the air should be renewed. You know, there's things that talk about it anywhere from three to 10 times, let's say, uh, it, per hour. But there's no specific guideline right now for that. Uh, so we're kind of thinking three to nine is somewhere in the range that should be okay. The, the problem, of course, is that if you look at it, you'd say well, it's, it's pretty difficult to calculate um, how often it is being renewed because each room happens to be a different size, a different layout, different things blocking it, uh, the lo location of air sources and exits are all different. So that, that, that's why it, it appears at times to be a little bit daunting. Yep. So the approach to the clean air is very much follows what Ann showed in that uh, slide sl show from uh, the New York Times. Ventilation is first and mo most importantly and least expensive way to provide a, a starting point of, of really getting clean air. It's also very low hanging fruit. I mean, it's not, to open a window and door is not hard unless you don't have windows and doors. Then of course, it becomes more challenging. Um, and the use of box fans to pull, as Ann pointed out, out of the building and open windows to allow some fresh air to come in is something I think we all understand as being a, a good way to uh, to see uh, uh, you know clean air coming along. The the next step after that, and, and I think really we get a lot of benefit just from the ventilation. And you'll see a couple of, in one slide just a simple example of how much you can do with a, a box fan. But the next step after that is if you can't do ventilation, can you do filtration for cleaning the air? So you remove the particles by having enough filtration devices around to pull them in and, and trap them. Not quite as good, but it, it does end up giving uh, new air that's, that's been reused, but is uh, pretty much cleaned. And then many of these filtration devices, which uh, Rob will show what he's been working with, um, also include uh, a disinfection type of a, a, a layer to them. In other words, they filter first, trapping the particles as much as possible. And then whatever doesn't get through there, they use some form of a UV light or membrane to kill the germs again to provide, I'll call it quote unquote, fresh air. The next slide. 
So this is just something that shows that it really isn't all that daunting in terms of figuring out what, a first step on it. You know, if you take your room and you calculate the volume of the room in cubic feet, then you know, and we do know, and you can look this up, box fans generally, almost all of them, have a spec that gives them, they pull out 2,500 cubic feet per minute of air or push that amount of air. So if I had a, a room, let's say of 25 by 50 with an average height of 20, not a very large church, but you know, not, not, it's not the cathedral, but it's a reasonable sized church. That would mean that I have with a box fan, six exchanges per hour with one box fan in the door pulling the air out and maybe one or two windows open on it. So even in a relatively limited open space with few or no open windows, a $20 box fan you know, can, can be a help, especially if it's put in a doorway. And if on the opposite end of the room, we have the uh, ability to open a window or get some fresh air coming in uh, naturally on that side of it. So. Next slide. And then we're gonna come to what's, I think, what's gonna be a question for everyone perhaps today and especially as we hit, hit the fall is, what do we do in the winter time? Uh, we, we, we really can't leave all of our windows open. We can't have our doors wide open. Well, maybe we could, but I mean, it would be pretty, pretty uncomfortable. Um, and that then comes to really the, uh, the second layer of approach, which is the powered air cleaners. Um, they filter and disinfect, as we said. The other approach is to, and we've had this on the website, is to use HEPA filters in free airflow units or in an air conditioner that's run only in a fan mode that allows some filtration. And then I think with those two things, perhaps keeping some outside air access into the, uh, into the church. Um, of course, the last thing is you can always, if you have the money and the, and the time and the availability, you can hire some consultants that can calculate this stuff a lot better than we can. But I think the real thing is that it's, it's not a, uh, it's not a daunting problem to, to, to see that with a little bit of um, a placement of fans and a few open windows that you can get quite a bit of air exchange. I think that's really the message here. Uh, last slide. And so Rob is gonna talk about these filtration units that he's purchased for Swanton and put in place, which are very cool. But they are quite a bit more expensive than the $20 Walmart box fan. And that's sort of the, uh, the conclusion of it. Rob, do you want to talk about your uh, filtration units? Sure. So, thank you, Bob. I'm uh, Rob Spain. I'm the rector at Holy Trinity in Swanton and the vicar of St. John's Highgate. And I've served, uh, gladly served, and have been a privilege to serve on the Restart team for some time now. When we realized some time back that the science indicated that air movement was the key to a healthier environment, as Bob has just said, there's some real cost-effective ways to do that. We did take some steps at Holy Trinity to assess our building. Uh, I first contacted the fire marshal through our facilities manager, and I wanted to be sure how many people were allowed in our building when we would get back to the time where we could be in the building. And the fire marshal came, we have a really good one, did a great uh, assessment of our building overall, the total capacity was signed. I actually have a copy of that fire marshal report, but we don't need to show that today. For the nave itself, for us, ours was 124 people, excluding uh, standing room. I knew that was not the number we would be working with because that's you know cheek to cheek, if you will, in the pew. So this was reported on an official form for us from the fire marshal, but for air movement and for safety for COVID, et cetera, um, we knew that we were going to have to spread that out. We weren't sure exactly what the rules would be, but as we began to look at that, we knew that we would have to have better air movement in the building, um, and that probably about half that number would be what would be allowed in our buildings if we, in our uh, nave, if we had the proper air movement and disinfection. So next we looked into the local high school in which I served on, as a board member to see the machines that they were using and they cost approximately $1,400 a piece. They did a great job, but that's a lot of money. So my crafty facilities manager found the same type of machine from FW Webb, which has offices I found out uh, 
as a result of this all over the state and for half that price. So um, they came in, Webb came in and did a free assessment of our nave and parish hall because we knew one day we would be back in there and concluded for the nave with the doors and the windows open, fans turning in the ceiling, which are up above here, above my picture here. Uh, and we have an air exchanger that works, uh, just moving air from the outside with those on and all the windows open because even our stained glass windows open, the doors open as well that we would be able to exchange air seven to nine times an hour with eight machines and all of this happening. Uh, the restart team recognizes something closer to three to four exchanges uh, per hour. And as, as Bob just said, there's ways to do that uh, pretty inexpensively with box fans and windows open. The machines that we purchased, and there are eight of them in the building, have UV light purifiers and HEPA filters completely cleansing the air that run through them. Uh, again, uh, cleansing the air every hour, seven to nine times in our building. In our estimation, uh, all of this was a great plus, not only in pandemic times like now, but for flu and stomach viruses and colds and all those things that Ann talked about, we really have because of masks and all of our, our care and um, during the pandemic, we really haven't seen so we're hoping that this will also help in the future. The investment was approximately $5,800. Um, and I've got some pictures which uh, uh, Kathleen can show of what they look like. Uh, and you just saw one of one set up in the church. Bob showed that. But this is the TRIO Plus filter, HEPA, uh, UVC and HEPA filter. So it has the UVC light built in it and a multiple stage of of filtration that happens. They cost around $700 a piece. And of course the number is dependent upon how much air movement there is and how much you want to, um, how much uh, air you want to move at a time during an hour. Um, the noise level is 55 decibels. That's the sound of a refrigerator uh, running. Basically a refrigerator is 37 to 47 decibels just to give you an idea of the air. Um, they do not produce ozone. They are 17 inches wide, 28 inches high, and nine inches deep. So they're, they're really easy and they, they are on rollers. They are energy star rated. Some folks were asking me about that. And the energy rating is 3.5 CFMs per watt, which for electrical people, that sounds cool. For the rest of us, Alexa says that they're 40% more efficient than most models. So they, they, run, they run pretty well in terms of electricity. We haven't opened our buildings yet, uh, so I cannot tell you from personal experience. They weigh about 26 pounds on rollers and we will plan to run them for an hour before the service and a bit after to clean the air and then turn them off until the next service. When the parish hall's back in use, we can roll a couple of those in there if needed and in our upper uh, room vestry meeting. So they are very portable and easy to move around. Again, once we're able to move into those other areas, uh, with, with our phase four plan being approved and then subsequent uh, permissions given. Uh, the pictures of how they operate, as you can see right here, if you'll move one up, yes. Thank you, Kathleen. This shows you how the air passes through. And of course, the very last at the end is the UV light. Uh, so it passes through all of these, um, these uh, uh, measures to clean the air and then puts out a completely clean air at the end. We estimate that we would, they estimate that you would run them regularly like in a school. We do not think so, obviously. We would run them for maybe two hours, three hours on a Sunday, so that we would think there would be uh, servicing every two to three years of about $150 to check the lights and the filters and so on and so forth. We, we're happy to share what we have, uh, what we've experienced and FW Web was absolutely wonderful. There's no charge for the assessment. Of course, they do expect you to buy, but there's no promise to buy. They can assess your building. I've been contacted by one priest to borrow one for a vestry meeting to see how they work and how, how they sound, and I'm gladly obliged. And then another case of cooperation and, and uh, the cooperative spirit of the Episcopal uh, Diocese of Vermont, I was contacted by another priest who said, hey, what are the possibilities that maybe we could work on a bulk purchase and maybe get a cheaper price? So there are all sorts of opportunities out there. This, I think, takes us to the next level uh, uh, above what Bob was talking about, which I think will also help us during the winter time. And that's it.
And so I believe we're going to uh, open up for questions. Is that right, friends? Mm -hmm. No, Fred has something. Oh, Fred has something. But Kathleen, if you just want to put up those uh, sample yes, diagrams for, for just for a moment. Yep. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to show folks um, a few sample diagrams from a few applications that have come into us already for phase four, just to um, help people uh, feel a little more comfortable about drawing diagrams of your spaces. Um, this doesn't have to be rocket science. You can make it rocket science, and I'll show you some rocket science in a minute, but it doesn't have to be. Um, a simple drawing of the spaces that you're going to use for worship or me and meetings, that's your indoor spaces. Um, just please, the uh, maybe the most um, important thing for us at this time is, um, well, certainly that the spacing that you anticipate among people, but even more than that, if you can show us where the doors and windows are. Uh, so if you can indicate on your uh, sketch of your space, where the doors and windows are and what, what the, um, you know, the airflow might look like, that would be helpful. Uh, Kathleen, can you flip to another one? Um, okay, so here's another one. And uh, again, this is a, maybe a little more uh, like an architect's drawing, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be this. Um, again, if you can show us your windows and doors, that's uh, really what we most like to know about, as well as your anticipated spacing of people. Next one, Kathleen, one more. Uh, so this is maybe more like rocket science, and if you want to get a, uh, uh, you know, something detailed like this, that's that's great. But it doesn't have to be one more. I think there's one more. Yeah. So here's another drawing, um, and um, you know, it really just uh, something on a piece of paper that you uh, scan. Uh, but please show us the doors and windows and how the air flows, so we uh, have an idea that you you've thought that through as carefully as possible. Thanks, Kathleen. Of course, I apologize for uh, for jumping to questions. <laughs> All, right, so have questions. All right. So um, for those who who don't know me, my name is Kathleen, and I help out with uh, with with communications for the Diocese of Vermont uh, very happily. Um, so we're going to offer this opportunity for questions. This is a bit of an odd uh, Zoom meeting format for us in that you will note that at this moment, um, no one can take themselves off of mute. Uh, so we're, the way we're going to do this is first, I'm actually going to ask some questions that have come in over email. Um, and then uh, people may ask questions by uh, not, not raising your hand this way, um, but raising your hand using the Zoom function. And so most of you will probably see there's a button called reactions. Um, and under there, you can raise your hand. Um, and then finally, a uh, last way to uh, to ask questions is by using the chat box, which you will see uh, you can ask questions there. I can already anticipate that we're probably not going to get all through all of them. Um, so do know uh, that you can email any questions going forward. Um, and I think we'll put that email address, Fred, maybe in the chat so that people have it. Um, but, uh, but for now, let's get started with questions and our panelists should feel free to sort of dive in uh, where, they, where they feel so moved. Um, so we have a question from Michael who asks, he says he, he imagines that questions regarding singing will be addressed. Um, I, so, so I suppose if someone felt comfortable sort of addressing uh, both choir and congregational singing at this point, that would be really helpful. Um, and then he is asking, um, so he says a specific reason is we have a parishioner who is a retired professional trumpeter and asked about playing hymns, descants once worship returns. Um, so again, those are kind of two music related questions, both with voices and instruments. Hi, I can take care of that. Hi, I'm Amy Spagna, I'm the rector at St. James Woodstock. Um, we are working on guidelines for that. Um, there has been, um, there was a huge study commissioned by a number of professional musician organizations, choral directors, um, high school music um, associations and conducted by University of Colorado and University of Maryland. Um, there is a huge paper that was just published about four weeks ago on this topic. Um, and it, it, um, it, it does go into a lot of that um, as far as what they recommend 
Um, basically, it's wear a mask. And if you've got a brass instrument, um, if there are mas masks, basically, you can put over the bell. Um, just speaking very generally, we haven't generated guidelines for congregational singing choirs yet. Um, we're working on that still, but it is worth noting that the Vermont Department of Health website still does not recommend doing congregational song at this point in time. Um, but again, we, that, that, that is in process and we're hoping to get that um, guidance out to congregations in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we have a question from Paul that says, as we enter phase four, may congregations resume usual administrative work patterns? Can staff return to their offices for regularly scheduled work days and work together in church buildings? May parishioners and general public enter the building to transact business? What guidance is there for such resumption of operations? Uh, staff and uh, uh, administra administration administrative people have been able to come into our buildings to do work uh, under phase uh, three, I think actually under phase two as well, so for a while. So that's okay. We've um, not gone so far as uh, the general public yet. Um, hopefully we can in the near future, but we've decided to concentrate first on worship and uh, church related committee meetings. And then to go to um, uh, perhaps other groups that use the may use the buildings uh, such as rental groups. And uh, we're also quite concerned about um, seeing what we can do about 12 step programs. Those are things we'll be working on in the near, very near future. We did recently, uh, just a few days ago, put out something about the feeding programs. Um, so, uh, you know, with cautions, those can be uh, resumed according to the uh, protocol that was sent out a few days ago. Kathleen, I want to just make one comment. In one of our recent updates on the website, we did talk about choirs um, rehearsing and that guidance from the CDC and the state health department. And I think it makes sense is that if people are fully vaccinated, both shots plus two weeks, um, then they can participate in a choir practice. Um, and um, it would be incumbent on the choir director and clergy to really confirm that that's the case, that those, all those individuals are fully vaccinated appropriately and have had two weeks for the second one to work. So that's, that is big for choirs, um, but it excludes people who are not fully vaccinated or who are immune suppressed. So unfortunately, that's an ex exclusion which each parish will have to figure out if they want to do. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, from Mary Jane, uh, she has a question about the distribution of printed materials at worship services. Hmm. Any, are they, is it allowed, any tips? <laughs> uh, this thing is not transmitted by touch. Um, so, I mean, there's really not any scientific re reason not to have printed materials that you hand out to people that they then toss in a recycling container or take home with them. Isn't it funny how that seems, you know, the, how, how we had to change all of that as we learned more. Yeah. 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 And then we have a few questions um, that kind of are falling under, like, when can we start holding indoor services? When exactly? Um, when can we have uh, communion, communion services uh, regularly? I'm wondering if someone might um, outline where we are now in phase four. And I'll, while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and post the most recent uh, post from the website in the chat. Maybe I can start on that. Um, we are receiving phase four applications. We've gotten quite a few in the last week. Uh, so it may take us a couple of weeks to um, get through all those that have come in already. And we'll just uh, keep, you know, keep going as they come. Uh, so if you don't hear from us within a week, please give us another week to, to get to yours. Uh, we, uh, under phase four, uh, parish related committee meetings can take place indoors if you have an approved phase four plan. And uh, I'll let the Bishop confirm this, but I believe uh, we are uh, permitted now to hold regular communion services outdoors um, yes, Bishop, I think that's right. Yes. right. You know, and things have changed so quickly after being so stagnant for a while that 
I have to admit, I don't even remember when that change was because Pentecost. Change, yeah, I mean, and and things came so quickly with the CDC's announcement, and we we're trying to keep up with that and not keep it slow. So we're, you know, we've made several changes since then, like three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there are, but Pentecost, right? We could, yes. well, there are guidelines for communion outdoors at Pentecost and, and you can do it as many. All day, every day if you want to. Yeah, and <laughs> under those guidelines, we do still recommend the true vine chalices or uh, simply wafers, not a common cup at this point. Right, but oh, I yeah, think no. the guidelines for indoors and outdoors are the same. Yes. Right. 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 So that if we can, if someone can do it indoors, it seems logical if they follow that same guideline. Most guidelines are the same. So once you've done, once you're, once you're allowed yeah. indoors, yeah, yeah. Once you've done your phase four plan and approval, then it, you can also do communion indoors. But even without a phase four plan, you can do communion outdoors. Correct. With, with a phase three plan. With a phase three plan. Yeah. I see applause. I see the applause emojis. <laughs> Um, okay, from Beth Ann, can you clarify the capacity of the room re regarding six foot spacing between households or 100 square feet per household if we establish vaccination status? I'll take I'll take that one because okay. that whole 100 square feet per unvaccinated person came from the state meeting planners and wedding planners, I think. And it was very confusing when they put that out. And uh, uh, we went along with being really confused. We've completely dropped that 100 square feet um, guidance because it didn't seem meaningful for us. Um, and um, so what we're asking people to do indoors is still maintain six foot spaces between individuals or family groups um, for now as well as maintaining masking for everyone who's indoors, um, for everyone. Um, and so just six foot space. And we're still not distinguishing between vaccinated and unvaccinated people at this point. Because, because we don't want, yeah. Well, we, if, if you know you're vaccinated, I think if you read that update, mm. that could be the equivalent of a, if you're sitting together because you know you're all vaccinated and you've been sitting together, you're still masked. That could be a household group. That's a household group. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that's how the uh, the updated guideline reads. And it and it, it's incumbent on individuals to be honest with themselves and their parish about whether they're fully vaccinated plus two weeks or not. Right. Um, because we really don't want to be the source of spread. We want to continue to be careful, which all of us have been so careful but yeah I, true and, and i will add something really quickly you know it's <laughs> if, if you've heard me talk maybe three times you you will hear that i think that you know we're always preparing for guests whether we never have them or not i mean that's just <laughs> the way i think about um gathering and so and even if we don't have guests, you know, we don't want to, as we're entering into worship, ask people, are you vaccinated? And if somebody has an issue with vaccination, um, you know, that's not going to be a, a barrier to them being able to be included in worship because we know that we've got all manner of varieties of people in our congregations. And so without having, um, with taking that step, more people can be together safely. And um, I, oh, well, I'll just wait until somebody asks a question. So I won't add, add any more to that. Well, this one is close to my heart because it's from Eileen in my, uh, in my sending parish. And I know exactly the space she's talking about. She asks for those with very high ceilings, <laughs> greater than 25 feet, does all of that need to be calculated in the cubic footage? Uh, I, I might answer that. Bob, you might chime in on this too. What I understand from FWWeb, they took the whole space that you're seeing behind you, all of that into account and the movement of air when they calculated the number of machines that we would need along with the movement of air to purify the air. So that, and I have big fans up at the top that move the air down. So I don't know if the church that you're referring to does or not, 
but they do take the whole space into account and the movement of air uh, across the space is the way I understand it. Um, Kathleen, I will say that someone did ask about uh, needed per uh, number, the number of units needed per cubic feet. And if you wanna get to that, when we can, we can pull up that slide with the machine on it, the second one, and it actually shows you at the bottom. Oh, uh, it, actually, it does say how much it is. It's 300 cubic feet per minute. Yes. Per unit. And, so uh, if you have eight of them, they are equivalent of one box fan. Average three air exchanges per hour. Which would give you, depending upon the space you're doing, like in Rob's space, it's six to nine air exchanges per hour. Right. And I think the idea of how high it is, it's more of an average. You're not trying to be exact. There's, there's no point in that because all this stuff is very approximated. But right. a good average is, is important. I think you're right. I think it's the cross, the cross air that's going to be important, the way the, the air crosses and passes through. Well, I... we're doing math, church. <laughs> um, I have unmuted uh, Kathy Hall, who I believe had a question. Kathy, you can go ahead and talk if you would like. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm calling from the Rutland area. I'm a member of Trinity Rutland um, Vestry. And um, I, we put in our application to be able to have in, indoor in-person services almost two weeks ago and had hoped we might by some miracle do it on Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday, we set up on a broiling hot uh, parking lot, which is where we can all be spread out and where we can uh, have an extension cord for our mic. And um, we ended up picking up the service the minute it was over in pouring rain. So outside just doesn't quite hack it. And we are an enormous church. Um, when I first started at Trinity 43 years ago, we had two packed services every Sunday morning. Now we're lucky if we get 30 or 40, we would no way have to sit more than 10 feet up. We can sit more than 10 feet apart. We have a huge high ceiling. We have windows open on both sides. We have three doorways we can open. We are losing people. There are churches down here that have been open since January. They haven't had anybody get sick. They're very strict. We're ready to be very strict. We're very responsible. We don't want our people to get sick, but it's, we are really, we're really shrinking. And it's scary. And if we want Rutland Trinity to survive, we can't sit on our hands anymore. So, I mean, we applied at our last vestry meeting tomorrow night. It will have been two weeks, and we we sent off our thing that night or crack of dawn Friday morning. And I realized that was a lot to expect that maybe we could hear by that Sunday. But um, we would really love to be in our church this Sunday. And and we need to be. We don't. We don't have an easy way. We have a lot of old people too, so they're not going to sit on the tarmac and run the risk of, you know, getting struck by lightning under their umbrellas. So, it's just, um, it, it, it's. We we need to get going, and we and we are ready, and and we are very conscientious about our spacing and our masks and our contact tracing and all of that is in place and ready to go. And, and I also realized we need to get ready for fall and when we have to close those windows. And I was delighted to hear about these air purification systems because we'll get going on that. Yeah, I respond to that, that we have your application and we are uh, working our way through all the applications that have come. We'll get to yours as soon as we can. Uh, there was only one meeting since the time your application was received. So we are uh, in receipt of it and we'll get to it uh, Hopefully, uh, in a few days. That's the best I can tell you right now. We have a lot to deal with, but uh, there are many people in your same situation. Is anybody open yet? Is anybody doing indoor services yet? Not yet. Last week we spent um, time because there's a very time sensitive matter um, around people who've been um, people experiencing homelessness and being able to figure out plans for how to make sure that ministries that attend to um, their food needs, which are gonna be um, even greater than they were in, in previous months. And so we 
handled those plans last week. Um, and we've, you know, been meeting actually a little bit extra um, once the CDC came through with their changes. So, you know, meeting as quickly as we can to cover as many um, requests as possible. Um, you know, none of, <laughs> none of us wants to take any longer than we have to. And that has been the commitment of the restart team, um, considering all of that, along with, um, you know, health concerns and just how to make sure that we're being diligent about these things is, you know, we, <laughs> we don't know how to rush it any, any faster than we can. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Paul Olson to go ahead and ask his question, then I'm going to go to the chat, then I'm going to come back to Richard. <laughs> okay, so this was in the chat, so maybe it won't need to be pulled from there. I'm wondering, is there any guidance for us for the meeting of parish groups inside the building in terms of the protocols to be observed by those groups when they do meet, um, either from the committee tonight or is there something coming in our direction to give us greater guidance on protocols for those parish meetings indoors. We had uh, published protocols for audit committees and we were pretty much following those uh, kinds of guidelines for parish committees. So in the, um, we did state in one of the updates recently, we stated that parish related committees um, could meet um, but other committee members refresh my memory as to where we um, left that because I know we, we are not yet um, we're dealing with rental groups and those sorts of groups. We're limiting this to uh, parish related committees. Um, I think we would, you know, for uh, uh, anything more than an audit, something the size of an audit committee, um, other members, uh, you know, fill me in if I've missed it. But, um, I believe where we are is for anything beyond an audit committee of that, something of that size, um, we'd like to see a phase four plan to assure airflow and um, you know, cir air circulation, you know, that the space is safe, that sort of thing. Uh, Anne, do you have? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's right. And I, I think, um, again, as we said in the audit committee guidelines, which came out quite a few weeks ago, um, if all but one of the members is oh, yeah. fully vaccinated, then they can meet and do their work around a table. So one unvaccinated person plus any number of fully vaccinated people can meet in a room um, as you could safely have dinner together in your home. Um, With or without masks? Um, Probably well if you're you know if you're fully vaccinated and all the vaccinated people are perfectly healthy and not immune suppressed and confident, then you could meet without masks. I think typically the the unvaccinated person should be masked, however. Hmm. And, and in socially many, distanced to the greatest extent if it's a Bible the, study yeah, group, something like that. Yeah, to the greatest extent, open a window, you know? Mm -hmm. Open a window. I think. Uh, you know, a, a lot of us are pretty, I mean, as, as eager as we are to get together, we're, a lot of us are pretty anxious about being close together, um, even with our fully vaccinated friends. You know, it's, so I think one of the things we've discussed is always making allowance for somebody who's fully vaccinated, but comes into a room and hasn't been in close contact with anybody outside their family for a really long time. Uh, part of welcoming those people is being cognizant of that. So yeah, I think, you know, a, a kind of a baseline would be, yeah, wear a mask and, you know, kind of open a window and stay apart from people. Yeah. I think uh, our, that help? I, don't know. I think our guidance would be to, um, you know, not have too large a group at this point. Uh, so, so get your phase four plan into us so we can right. approve that for you and then you're in better shape. You know, one of the things I want to add about um, why we're asking for, for plans, not just because <laughs> we want to check up on, you know, every single tiny detail that people are doing, but, um, you know, people, <laughs> 
of, of different denominations and even other dioceses are allowing different sorts of um, movement and at different times. And we don't have all the numbers of who has or hasn't gotten sick from those activities. But I just know the stories that my colleagues tell um, that are Episcopalians and that have had, you know, in, in various situations. And, you know, they, they do have people that, uh, I mean, lots of clergy, bishops, <laughs> parishioners who've gotten sick and some have died. And we, we don't have that, that is not the case. And we also know of instances of um, where things were spread in churches in Vermont and the communities of those churches were very angry that they made those choices. Um, it is, it's not evangelistic. It's not gonna grow the church if, if something happens in one of our places. And because of the, you know, how people are feeling through this time, people are really, I don't even know how to describe the, the um, just the national, well, the worldwide trauma that this pandemic has, um, you know, has been for all of us. And, you know, we, we have a pretty litigious society and um, I, I don't want to expect that people are going to come into our buildings and think, well, if something happens to them, that they're going to sue us if they get sick. But if you go into some secular places, you'll, you'll see that they do have waivers that you can sign that, that say that you're not going to sue them if you get sick. So it's happening. People are doing that. And we're not going to have people sign anything to say that they won't sue us. And, um, you know, we actually do pay insurance, um, individual congregations and the diocese and church insurance who covers, you know, the diocese very early on in the pandemic said that, you know, they would support people if they were taken to court, not necessarily pay out any payments, but if we have followed guidelines. So at the very least, if someone says, well, such and so happened and, and St. Swithin's by the lake and we got sick there, well, we'll say, well, you know, we knew that they took precautions. Um, you know, we can show you what they did and, you know, did our best to make sure that no one was sick. So those are also things that we think about. Um, and usually when a congregation is sued, then the diocese is also sued because they know that there's more financial resources in, in those places. So, you know, I, I hate to have that as part of our thinking, but, you know, that, that's part of the world that we live in. Thank you. I do want to at least get to our um, our chat questions. And I told Richard uh, that we would we would give him a chance to ask his questions. Panelists, is that okay to go a little after eight? Yes. Okay. Um, so Neil Robinson asks, what is the status of the VOSHA COVID training and certification? It seems to have been omitted from the website. And someone helpfully offered a little bit of explanation in chat, but I'd love for someone to, to say it out loud for those who aren't following the chat. It, it has, it's not there. Um, so we are um, asking that um, people, the parishes simply um, assure that they're uh, be sure that their designated health officers understand their responsibilities at this point. Um, we feel that most people, uh, just about everybody knows about COVID, but uh, be sure that your people understand their responsibilities at gatherings, at your gatherings. Uh, Anne, if, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, uh, we, exactly. The VOSHA training doesn't exist anymore. It's not available anymore. And so part of the phase four application at the bottom, we just made a list of things that you need to be aware of. You don't have to answer us about, but there's a list of things you need to be aware of. And that includes the things that the designated health officers need to do and be and know how to do. Um, so that, and that's instead of any VOSHA training anymore. And crucial things that a designated health officer would do would be to maintain a record of um, attendees for possibility of contact tracing should that ever be necessary and to um, facilitate um, you know just people um, doing what they're supposed to do behaving as they're supposed to in the gathering uh, maintaining uh, keeping their masks on properly worn and whatever distancing uh, is uh, uh, required 
uh, for their uh, for that gathering, um, and facilitating the uh, the movement of people um, so that we aren't we're not congregating in uh, you know very close proximity. Yeah, I, I will add that uh, on my application that I just submitted to, to uh, for Holy Trinity, I included uh, the guidelines for my DHOs, the designated health officers, and the ushers. If someone would like to use mine, speaking of being collaborative, if they'd like to look at those and then jump off of those, I'm more than happy to share those if anybody wants those. I think we, could, we'll, we probably uh, want to put out a, a, a brief statement from the committee summarizing those things. That would be helpful to folks. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Good evening. Uh, Rich Jones, Trinity Rutland. Uh, let me just start say I, all throughout this whole pandemic, I have supported the bishop, the diocese, uh, the governor, the, uh, the president, the CDC. Uh, so I'm not some nutter anti-vaxxer, uh, but I am frustrated. And something Fred, I believe, just mentioned that uh, the, there's a committee that meets perhaps once a week to decide these uh, applications. And from being spending 36 years of my 68 years on vestries, I know that the surest way to grind work to a halt is to have it done by a committee. I'm wondering if they can streamline this uh, application process by just having one or two people. It's not rocket science at this point. And, and I, I just feel that we're getting stuck in the weeds here and, and a little bit too much hand wringing. It's time to get back in the water. Uh, we know the shark might come back, but that's a risk that, you know, we're, we're, we're as safe as we're gonna be right now. So I would just ask that they do everything they can to speed up this process with the applications because like uh, uh, Kathy Hall said, we're, we're losing people and other churches have to be losing people also. So I have to say, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, we, I and others have been working on our day off um, to attend to some of these things. It really is a lot because, you know, because we are dealing with life and death <laughs> and we know that it takes more than one or two people. We don't have even the, the kind of capacity um, to do that on, on my staff. And so it takes, you know, enough people to read things. And, um, you know, people are also doing research at the same time and staying ahead of, you know, what is coming up. And we know that when we began the pandemic, the, the way that the science came out, one of the things that we also learned was that when people made quick changes, that sometimes the science wasn't there available, giving us the information that we needed. And so, I mean, we're working as quickly as we can. We don't, I mean, people are working on days besides the days that we meet. Um, and, you know, if it saves a life or two, and, you know, I don't know what to say for us. It, it just has to take the time that it takes. Well, I, 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 appreciate, I, I appreciate that, but I feel that, uh, you know, you have to give some, some credence to the congregations themselves, that they are responsible adults and they can make some of these decisions. I mean, uh, we, we don't have to be told every little nit. I'll, I'll, that's my piece. Yeah, and, and there are guidelines that people have to do um, specifically to fit the place where they are. And again, with the, it, along with the litigious thing, if we don't have an actual um, plan that says that people took care, then you know we we cannot support each other well if something were to happen, and you just can't take back the sickness once it's happened if somebody gets it. I'll just also say that um, we had a, a lot of work to do one week ago, as all of your application. There's a long list of applications that came in, um, but I think they're going to churn out approvals very fast. And we meet again on Thursday. So I think you'll be seeing answers coming back quickly. Thank you. Um, oh, good. Thank you, Fred, for answering that in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, do we have time for another out loud question? All right. Uh, oh, hold on, Luann. Let me make it so you can actually unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> I'm here. Hi. Hi, uh, Louie Wood, 
I'm a um, parishioner in Swanton at Holy Trinity. Um, in my day life, I'm a registered nurse, case manager. I work for the state of Vermont, just like full disclosure stuff here. Um, and I've worked hand in hand with the Department of Health. I'm also not a nutter, <laughs> but I'm, you know, pro vaccine, you know, uh, and been working. I mean, I've been working vaccine clinics, helping with the BIPOC clinics. Uh, I've tried, I've worked homeless GA hotel clinics. That those are my people. These are my people. Um, so I just want to say a couple things around the litigious piece. I think the more specificity we're asking individual parishes to give and potentially hold themselves to actually feels more litigiously daunting because uh, if the recommendations are universal guidelines and if the universal, you know, if those are being delineated by the CDC and, uh, you know, BDH and all of these folks, I don't know. That, I guess I think my point's made there. I think we should be following what is being presented to us and it's changing so rapidly that I don't know how then we are also changing our phases to match them. Um, so it's just like a, I guess a point of information. It's just something that had jumped to my mind. Um, and I agree with getting us back in there. Um, I know personally, we have 15, 16 people in my family alone that attend and we'd all like to be back attending. Um, and I also think that while I might not necessarily personally believe because of our family, aside from children under 13, we have one 13 year old who's getting his second shot on Friday. Mm -hmm. We're all fully vaccinated. Um, and then we have a little handful of children. And I understand and I can respect trying to care for all of the people. So, you know, if wearing a mask is a part of it, I'm willing to concede that. That feels like such a little thing to concede after the year, 15 months that we've endured. Um, I guess the piece that I'm a little bit like, it, it's again, this, the, the planning and, and, and I understand that when the planning started, we were in a very different place than, than maybe we have evolved to. So I just, I think that the long list of people putting in their plans is very indicative of people wanting to be back. And if we can do it with masks and, you know, universal guidance and, not so much uh, heavy handedness guidance, it might be very, it might be very effective. And I could talk forever because I'm a nurse and I'm a Leo, <laughs> but I will leave it at that. And thank everybody. And thanks for all the hard work. This is not, this has been a really difficult for a lot and peace and love. Would anyone like to respond or should I move on to a question? I think we can proceed. Okay. Yes, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Luann. I have a question uh, from Melanie about, uh, about hybrid worship and uh, who's doing it and where there might be examples, how people might learn a little bit more about that. I'll say something quick about that. Several people, I know I shared a, a link at one of our clergy meetings and um, I've heard about another training for uh, hybrid worship. And there's, <laughs> there's, there's two layers of that. There's a technical piece and then there's a theological piece. You know, there are people who were included in worship that hadn't been um, because they were sick and shut in and then all of a sudden now they can you know go to church every day sometimes some people do or twice a day and so how to keep those people with us now that we've included more people will be a challenge and it's gonna some some attempts are going to be great some are not and and then um so that technical piece will will help uh, to keep these people together and I know I'm, I'm going to be taking a course along with several other people 
and those that are taking it will share what they've been learning. And I also know that Bob is going to um, do a tutorial, what I'm calling it. He said it's not a tutorial, but he's going to just show, um, you know, some simple things. And I found that the most effective thing, even though um, cell service isn't great all over Vermont, this has been the easiest thing, my, my, my phone, my cell phone, for connecting into a service when I'm outdoors and being present to people outdoors and people on a Zoom screen somewhere else and just with earphones and it just, it's much more effective than all the fanciness. Um, so you can really go high tech or low tech, but I do think that it's part of, you know, what we're called to do and, and then our next phases of life together is how to keep more people connected. And, you know, with all of this, it's gonna take some learning and it's gonna take some experimentation and it takes time, you know, it's, it's worth it if it keeps us together. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Melanie. Well, do you want me to say a little bit about the so-called tutorial, <laughs> Bishop? So it's not really that, it's much as an example of what can be done pretty simply with minimal equipment. And it's just sort of a discussion around um, sorting out what you want to accomplish and then what you can do to accomplish it. And that, and I was actually thinking we could do that in two short sessions when people are ready for it. Excellent. And uh, Neil. You can unmute. Uh, thank you. Uh, this won't be too hard to answer. Uh, I learned some stuff tonight that surprised me, like the fact that the committee supposedly dropped the 100 square feet requirement, uh, communion when we want to outside. But what I'm really confused about is how do we know we have the most current guidance? Uh, for instance, Today, I finished up our phase four application and I'm getting it ready for our vestry to approve. And it was based on a document I printed off the diocesan website a couple of days ago. Now I just went there and printed out a newer one that's updated, but it still has reference to the 100 foot square feet uh, calculation. So how do I know that I'm responding to the correct list of requirements? The requirements are changing uh, in some cases daily, and we're trying to keep abreast of that. Um, Anne, can you? I, I, we, I just tell, will say we apologize for not having removed that 100 square feet thing a couple of weeks ago when it became clear that it really wasn't germane to us anymore. Um, so our apologies, but it's not there anymore. So you don't need to worry about it. And as the communicator, I can say we try to move as quickly as the changes move. And the other thing is that you noticed a change on the website between issues of the mountain. Um, so often, uh, you know, or not often, but sometimes there will be changes to the website before we're able to alert the entire diocese or the clergy list um, of changes. So, yeah. The, um, and the, the distancing is now six feet. It's not 12 feet, as you may have read uh, even a couple of weeks ago. Just and actually, the whole thing is rewritten quite a bit. I mean, that whole paragraph has been restructured to include vaccinated and unvaccinated and, and other issues. So, yeah, One of the things that we realized is, like I said earlier in the pandemic, it was so slow. And, you know, we were able to keep up with the work a lot faster or easier. And as things change and we get information and things, you know, come up from the CDC or, or from the governor, um, you know, what, what day was it that we put out the thing for um, helping people with food resources? I mean, that we just thought we, we didn't want to wait. You know, we, we know that we're changing things at a fairly rapid pace. Um, because we know that we're all anxious to get back to some things or on with some new things. And, um, you know, so if you notice a little something that's not matching up, 
send us a, a little email and say, hey, this doesn't match the other, and that will help us too. You can join our committee that way. How's that? You want another committee, don't you, Neil? <laughs> yes, you, and so you can always uh, email me uh, and you can, uh, and, but if you have a phase four plan that, that you feel you've done a competent job on, uh, send it in and if we have a question, or if we see something that uh, you know could be a little different, we'll let you know. Brett, I would just like to make a comment in response to Luann. Uh, thank you, first of all, for really pouring your energy into doing all of these clinics because it's been a huge effort and you and others have really um, made this happen in this, in this state. Um, and uh, it is through all of those vaccination clinics that this thing is going to come under control, both here in this country and internationally, because when there's pandemic overwhelming countries abroad, it's, it's still there and a danger to all of us. So um, for those of you, when you for, who've really poured your energy into it, I, I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate the energy that is around getting our, especially our children back together. Um, we're really struggling with that in this state because these, you know, because our kids are struggling with isolation and, and not being together. Um, so uh, any of you who've worked on the, the state guidance about day camps and schools and um, uh, daycare, um, it, it's, it's all about how to safely get everybody back together. So we're, we're aware of that and, and they need to be back together in youth groups and, and in our churches too. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Agreed, and I'm mindful of time. Are we gonna go to 8.30, friends, or I'm looking at your faces, or do you, or, okay, let's go to 8.30. All right, woohoo, y'all are so. Kathleen, yes. I, will, I will say that folks have called me too, as members of the committee, I, I know that we don't mind, we wanna channel it to a central person, but if someone's nearby or they you know, know a parish a little bit better, someone certainly call and ask us questions. If we can't answer right then, we'll find it very shortly. So I think anybody on the committee would be willing to respond uh, to questions that you have, because I know it can be a little bit nerve wracking putting all this together. And I'm gonna, Chaz, I'm gonna get to you just after this, uh, this next chat question I have, uh, which is kind of related to what you just said, Rob, but on the other side, uh, Mark asks, if you have a question about some aspect of our application, so this is for folks who have submitted it, will you reach out in real time um, instead of sort of deferring to a whole meeting? We probably will not reach out during our meeting because we don't have time to do that. Um, we will reach out to you uh, probably that evening or the next day. Excellent. Thank you. And Kathleen, we usually assign people to do that. So not one person just has to do that. We assign it out so that it gets done more quickly. Yeah, and it could be any of us. Got it. And often we try to field it to the person who might have some expertise or a little more familiarity with that topic. That makes sense. Great, thank you. Uh, Chaz. Actually, it was his wife, Becky, who had that put me. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get both our names on there. Um, I was, I haven't heard anything about walking it back because a lot of the pundits, you know, the health officials, et cetera, the experts have been saying that we're likely to have reoccurrences, especially as we get into the fall and the more inside things. How have we worked into our plan walking it back if we have to? I'll take that really quickly. Yeah, we already did have to walk it back once and I hated it, you know, um, yeah. right before Thanksgiving because I was, you know, I had been outside in October and, and I knew people were ready to be out even in the cold which is, you know, sounds crazy, but you know, we do crazy things and we want to be together. Um, so, I, you know, I, we know that that's always a possibility and hope that it won't be drastic. And, you know, because we've gone through so much of this and put into practice so many other things, it won't take much for us to be retooled to make changes. And I think that it'll also be different because of vaccines so that if we're, you know, indoors. And I mean, I know that when I visited my mother in Detroit, it was cold 
in um, April and we had the door, both doors open because we needed to. <laughs> and, you know, we were okay. It wasn't the best, but, you know, we'll figure that out in, in less time, I think, than it is to do something brand new. Excellent. Uh, from, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ann. No, I, so I see David Hamilton has a question that maybe I can um, take. Go ahead, that's but, where I was going. Um, so uh, they are looking at risk reduction for sure. They're hoping that when more than 80% of the eligible Vermonters, which again is not everybody in Vermont, has had one shot, that that'll decrease risk of having another surge of infections. Um, they're not saying that individuals who have had one shot or none are safe. And if you look behind the CDC and the state health department recommendations, it still says everybody who's not vaccinated fully, second shot, two weeks, needs to be in a mask. So um, we are, our, these phase four guidelines are open back up. Everybody's in the inside, but we're taking that keep the masks on seriously. Um, so that's why and where we are. So I think we'll actually be ahead of the state in terms of saying, yeah, people can be back in, um, but not saying, uh, we'll only allow fully vaccinated people in our churches. Or, nor are we saying we're going to ask at the door and kind of put you in a separate section if you're, if you're only partially vaccinated. Does that make sense? A little? Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Let's see. I, I I hope I did not miss anybody in chat. If so, raise your hands. But I think we may be wrapping up. Is there anything else that our panelists would like to add before we close? I'd like to thank everybody for your participation and your uh, uh, your questions and your comments. It's all. Uh, all of it is very, very helpful to us. It uh, helps us do what we've been called to do. So thank you for being here and for um, all that you've contributed tonight. Kathleen, there's one raised hand here. Yeah, there's one one last raised hand. One, yeah. Hi, Collins. I've just asked you to unmute. You should be able to. Collins, you will have to accept the yes. Oh, is it, is it too late for me to ask a question? It's not. Go ahead. Uh, good. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I I just I don't have my uh, phone sort of where I'm. That's right. But we can't hear you right now. So what's going on? And I've talking about the public walking across church property. Because in the past, we did have signage po posting the fact that on church property, you had to be masked. And we are one block off of downtown and lots of people cut through our yard um, and stop and maybe visit or either just cut through trying to do have a shortcut. Um, is that for the public walking through our property? Is that still something that we, yeah. Cut out Collins, but I think we got the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if people are outside, so and what's not, the, what is the? Yeah, if people are outside and not close together. The risk of transmission, even if you're not vaccinated, even if somebody happens to be COVID positive, if you're not close together and you're outdoors, the risk of transmission is really very low. So putting up barriers to your church property might be more than you need to do, is my personal opinion. That's where I would come down on it. Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah, I think that's where we'd be as, as the. As okay, the. so we can take down those signs that 
Yeah. We have signs that say masks are required on church property. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Just, in, just inside the building, but not on church property. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I guess um, I, the thing that I want to say is, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, who knew um, what this was going to be like? And I am so grateful to all the work that people have done and, um, you know, hard, hard, hard work. And I have to believe that We'll be stronger for it. You know, we've learned some new ways of taking care of each other and of being mindful to our communities and um, have been reminded of the struggles of the early church. And they went through a lot and, and they made it. And so did, and, and we are making it. We're still, you know, in this moving forward phase and still dealing with, with some of the beginning of the pandemic, but we really have lots to celebrate. And so thank you for all of your diligence, um, even when you didn't want to. And um, sorry, it's been so hard. Um, is it time to pray now? Okay, I think I'll close us with a prayer. And this is one that we've been praying at the Green Mountain Online Abbey recently. And I'm, I can't remember the person who wrote it. I found it somewhere, but it seems appropriate for now. God of love, you are with us in every transition and change. As we enter into this new time in our lives with excitement and even some anxiety, we recall your deep compassion, presence, and abounding love. We thank you for the gifts, talents, and skills with which you have blessed us. We thank you for the experiences that have brought us to this moment. We thank you for the work of others that gives breadth, and depth to our own work. Be with us as we move forward, rejoicing with you and supporting one another. We ask this in your holy name. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>